analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, John Mantella. Economics, demographics, and technology have a tremendous impact on labor. We're talking about demand, availability, wages. And when I talk about availability, I'm talking about individual people as well as skill sets. Skills on the very high level, skills on the very low level. is that growth will not exceed 3% this year, and there's a whole variety of reasons for that. Uh, I like to focus on the top seven reasons. Consumers represent 71% of GDP, 71% of economic growth. So if consumers are not confident, and they're not, and they won't be for some time, they spend less. Think of losing your job or having your job cut back from full-time to part-time, which is a major trend underway now. And secondly, housing. Now, the housing market has improved significantly over this last year, over the last few months. But the problem is this. The New mass bills last year were half of what they were in 2005. And although this number is improving, it's still pretty bad. 6.4 million consumers still are underwater, which means they own more on their homes than their homes are worth. Politics is polarized. And there's many reasons why it's polarized. But think of this. About 60% of congressional districts are gerrymandered to the point where the incumbent is likely to win re-election regardless of what position they choose because it's a safe district. So they can stake out positions on the far left, or they can stake out positions on the far right, and know with a good deal of certainty they're going to get reelected. The problem with this approach is they don't appeal to the center. It's much more difficult to compromise. Polarization continues. Gridlock continues. The European Union represents 71% of foreign direct investment into the US. And they're also the destination of 21% of US exports. So any issues in Europe have a huge impact on this side of the Atlantic. And think about this. The southern European countries haven't implemented any legislation to enhance competitiveness in decades. As a result, southern Europe has an unemployment rate, which is about twice as high as the north. Southern Europe really never adapted to globalization, which was the subject of my last book. Northern Europe, a whole series of new drivers on the horizon. Green industries, clouds, tablets, smartphones, hydraulic fracturing, 3D printing, nanotechnology, biotechnology. These are tremendous drivers of growth. But their impact won't be felt for another couple of years. Because the stock market in the US took a big hit which indirectly is a bit surprising because all developing countries, almost all, their GDP growth was downgraded last November. So there's nothing new with the fact that developing countries are incurring serious problems. But you can see that their growth rates are still considerably higher than advanced countries or the US growth rates. So you see the credit and commodity booms are over. When I say commodity booms, countries like Chile, Argentina, South Africa. In the past, they've sold a good deal of commodities, whether they were minerals or oil, to the Chinese. The Chinese demand for this has shrunken significantly. Also, with US interest rates rising, cheap money will not be as available as it has been in the past. So these future free trade agreements are unlikely to include developing countries. I wrote a couple books on NAFTA and other agreements. And I believe that they provide a good deal of kick in terms of these economies, but the developing economies really didn't reciprocate in many ways in the past. So they're likely to be shut out in future agreements, and the big one I'm talking about is the transatlantic trade agreement between the US and European countries. The Chinese uh, Academy of Social Sciences is a client of mine, so I spent time, and they're the government think tank. And at my recent visit, they talked about one of their stimulus packages and how they didn't have as many political concerns the US stimulus package had. And as a result, their stimulus package which was much more effective. And in the past, they looked at the US system of free market capitalism. I think they looked at the US system with awe. But because the recession began in the US, a lot of our faults have been exposed. And the Chinese, to a much greater extent, feel that their system is superior. 
I personally think that there's serious problems with the Chinese system, and they're going to incur these over the next several years. Their GDP growth rates, as I mentioned, were double digit decades ago. We're coming in at 7% and less. So scientists, I said in a very polite, respectful way, that the Chinese leadership was making very good decisions. But what happens in one or two generations when they're not so smart? That system has many flaws, and I think we're going to be seeing those moving forward. As we all know, the baby boom generation, if you were born between 46 and 64, is aging and retiring. We're talking about huge numbers of people. But the biggest problem is when they retire, they take their skills with them. Labor mobility has recently been at a 50-year low. So if you have a home and you can't sell your home, that's going to prevent you from being able to seek employment elsewhere or accept a job in a different state. That's another reason why I think we're looking at a skills deficit much greater than we have seen in the past. Also, companies are shifting more and more workers to part-time. And when they do that, those people that were full-time, you lose those people, of course, but you lose their skills. And the part-timers just don't have those same skills, of course. Today's jobs really require deeper skill sets and the ability to do a whole number of things. Think critically and solve analytical problems. You look at younger workers entering the force. It's very difficult to find people with these skills. Manipulate sophisticated technology. If you walk into a manufacturing facility, a textile facility, it almost seems as though you've got to be an engineer to work some of the machinery. It's so sophisticated. And especially in the hotel industry, finding younger people that can articulate with social grace is a real challenge. I've so got think about this. 600,000 manufacturing jobs went unfilled last year because manufacturers couldn't find the skilled labor. And unemployment was close to 8 9%. But here's the biggest problem. We hear that unemployment went from 7 to 6.7% in November to December. And the question is, did more people actually enter the labor force? Well, I would argue that the unemployment rate really is understated. In fact, if you just talk about the unemployment rate, you're actually misrepresenting absolutely everything because the unemployment rate in itself is almost meaningless. What kind of job growth would you really, really need if you wanted to bring unemployment down to 5 to 6%? Well, there's been a number of studies out on this, and McKinsey says that you've got to generate about 175,000 jobs each month for 10 years to bring unemployment down to 5 to 6%, which is considered normal. But here's the problem. We've never done it. The cost 30 million jobs are lost every single year, but a little bit more than 30 million jobs are gained. That's how big the U.S. job churn is. It's huge. So remember when they talked about outsourcing a few years ago? Forrester came out with a report probably 10 years ago. They were talking about a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction in terms of job loss as a result of outsourcing. In manufacturing, when people see the statistic and they see that employment is likely to continue dropping, people automatically default to the assumption that the manufacturing sector must be hollowed out. And if I was to go down the street and survey five people and say, what do you think of manufacturing? The vast majority would tell me it's being hollowed out. But it's really not. When you take a look at why manufacturing jobs decline, the real reason is US innovation, technology, and productivity. So you have now two people that can do the work of, say, 20 people 10 years ago, and they can do it in no time at all. So you need the US is one of the few advanced nations that actually have, has a population growth rate, a positive growth rate. If you look at Europe, it's neutral or negative. Countries like Russia or Italy have a negative growth rate. So what does that mean? That means there's fewer consumers and there's fewer producers. The US has a positive growth rate, which is really good for the economy moving forward. And much of that's due to immigration. And there's an immigration bill in Congress right now, and it keeps evolving. But the important point here is this. US educational system attracts the best and the brightest in the world. If you then take those people and you educate them, and then you send them back home to compete against us, that's really a failed immigration policy, especially when we have a labor skill. Think about this, in Silicon Valley. A few years ago, 
the stats were this, that half the CEOs and half the lead technicians were foreign born. So again, so when it comes to demographics, let's take a look at median ages. And Germany has the highest median age of the world. So 46.5, so that means half the population is older than that and half is younger. Japan is second. The US comes in with 37.3. So what does all of this mean? Well, if you're a manufacturer of games, say computer games, electronic games, you want to focus on those countries with the lowest median age. If you're a hotel, but what's happening in China? Labor rates are up 18% a year on average. When you factor in the rise of the renminbi, the Chinese currency, you're talking about labor rates now 20 to 25%. If you then factor in, and I was talking to Jonathan with this earlier, longer lead times, larger inventories, duties to get your, com your, your, your components in. China, quality control issues, the cost of sending engineers to, to China or India or Pakistan. So you're beginning to see a lot of products that were offshored moving back to the US. And the big America's energy revolution. It's changing absolutely everything in terms of manufacturing. So advanced horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracturing, has enabled companies to extract gas and oil from reserves that we never really paid attention to because in the past they were too difficult to get to. You couldn't access certain reserves because they were just, it was, the cost was prohibitive. But because of this new technology, you can now access these reserves and you can do it affordably. So now, and the Marcellus Shell, which I basically live on, is tremendous. We're looking at 141 trillion cubic feet of gas. Now, nobody knows what 141 trillion cubic feet of gas is. But let me mention this. That's the amount of consumption that will be demanded around the world in 10 years. So what is this all going to do to manufacturing? It's going to bring down the cost of manufacturing tremendously, and that will accelerate backshoring. And U.S. petroleum imports right now represent about 20% of all imports. And they contribute tremendously to the deficit. You now have if we do become energy independent or close to that, you now have huge amounts of money to spend right here in the US and not abroad. For those products that just can't be automated, and we're talking about quite a few products, Bangladesh, India, Thailand, Vietnam, a lot of the production that was done in China is moving to those next low cost producers. It's like we're also looking at an opposite trend called nearshoring. So what's happening is a good number of companies want to establish facilities, whether they're manufacturing, whether they're sales operations, whether they're warehousing, they want to locate those facilities as close as possible to their fastest growing markets. How important are currency risks? Well, whether you're establishing or investing in a hotel in India, or you're purchasing product, Political risk is tremendous, and we're seeing a lot more political risk now in developing countries. Now, banks, of course, will hedge your bets when it comes to currency. And, we've, and we actually projected in November that many of these emerging markets will begin devaluing their currencies, and they're doing that right now. But chances are, when you work with your bank, you eliminate almost all that risk. But the problem is you still have to be paid. And if the risks are high, you may just not be paid. Or if you're purchasing, you may just not receive your products. The assumptions that were given say five years ago, no longer hold. The assumption I've gotten mixed results on this. I know that if you're a family of four and you walk into Walmart or you walk into any store, Americans tend to vote with their pocketbook or they buy products based on the cost and the quality. Where the Japanese, for example, tend to spend more and buy Japanese products. So what strategies can you implement to attract and retain more employees? And the bottom line is, is that skills today are really the only sustainable competitive advantage in most industries for manufacturing, for example. In the past, the abundance of land or raw materials pretty much provided that country with a competitive advantage. <clears throat> today, skills are really the only sustainable competitive advantage. And the number one challenge he is, what do you do? Well, you've got to provide more education. You've got to provide more training. I think companies in all sectors will have to invest much, much more in lifelong learning. This is an amazing statistic that 70% of the youth in Switzerland 
are involved in apprenticeship programs. 65% in Germany, 55% in Austria. So I think moving forward, we really have no choice. And I'm not just well, talk you're talking about young people, you're talking about incentives with tangible short-term benefits. It no longer works where you can talk to an entry-level employee or somebody new on the payrolls and say, in three years, you're going to get this promotion, or in two years, you're going to get that. They want to know what I'm going to be getting next month or next Tuesday. So sourcing supplies from Asia. Remember the fire, I believe it was Bangladesh, where a large number of women had died in a fire. I bet you most of those manufacturers, most of the retailers that contracted the manufacturing had no idea that their products were being made in that facility. Because what happens very often around the world is you may be a producer and you contract with a supplier XYZ in Bangladesh and they contract to somebody else who contracts to their nephew, who contracts to their best friend, and by the time you're done, you have no idea who's producing your product. In the U.S., we really have a secret sauce that no other country, I, I believe, has. We have a system of free market capitalism. We have a can-do spirit here. We've got entrepreneurialism, really like no other country in the world. Innovation in the U.S. is tremendous. We still spend considerably much, much more in R&D than the next highest spender. Capital markets, although they function in odd ways sometimes, overall they're very strong. We've got a brilliant constitution with checks and balances, separation of church and state, rule of law. We really have a secret sauce that I believe will keep the U.S. on top for generations to come. So we talk about the Chinese. More, more people in health care, driving that number up, less and less people in the workforce paying taxes, more people getting you know, assistance somewhere we're broke. So where do you see that going? All right. Well, keep in mind, I am in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the business people I talk to are, um, as I mentioned, very uncertain. They just don't know what all the liabilities will actually add up to. So they've been holding off in terms of hiring when perhaps they need to hire. <laughs> and we Thank you very much. I just want to mention before coming up here, I made friends with the most important person in the room. This gentleman right over here was giving our last speaker a tough time. So I thought if I made friends with Lou Valardo, <laughs> if I made friends with Lou Valardo, maybe he would go easy on me. <laughs> China US tensions, I talked about this three years ago. And from my viewpoint, the tensions have just continued to increase. And one of the major reasons is to talk about the deficit. The deficit last year with China was 315 billion. But I would ask, what does that number really mean? Now, from all the talk in the newspapers and on television shows, you would think that the vast majority of U.S. investment goes to low-cost countries. It doesn't. Why? Because determinants of capital and flows include a lot more than cheap labor. If it was just cheap labor, Haiti would be a manufacturing mega powerhouse. Africa would be the most amazing continent. When you look at the realities and the hard facts, and you take the emotion and you put it aside, these agreements are very beneficial to the U.S., not just to business, but to their employees and the employees' families and the U.S. as a whole. We barely passed this agreement, so what's that mean? It's going to be very, very difficult to pass agreements in the future because even the most ardent, strongest supporters of globalization in Congress, they may believe in it, and some have actually told me on the side, you know, John, you're right, I agree with your analysis or presentation, but I can't sell that reality back home. John, could you touch on the NAFTA agreement? It's been about 10 years since that's been enacted, and a lot of controversy at the uh, concept of that. We're some 10 years into it. Has it been good or bad, or has there been a net decrease or increase or indifference? Uh, how would you analyze that? I wrote two books on Mexico and NAFTA, and in fact, in the book you have in front of you, there's a section on NAFTA. I believe the impact overall was very positive. NAFTA, very interestingly, really was an investment agreement because by Mexico signing on to NAFTA, that meant that future Mexican presidents couldn't change policy. What impact did that have? It made them a much more investment-friendly country, much more stable. 
as a result of that, they received more investment, but not just from the U.S., from around the world. And the legislators passed a resolution condemning free trade two or three years ago. And then I got a call from some of the, one of the members of Congress and some of the state assembly, and we basically put a great deal of pressure on the legislators. But they have no idea of the benefits, and I won't get into those now, but it's just, again, it's, the decisions are based on emotion with very little information, very little fact. So what is, all the, what is the impact of all of this misinformation? Well, people are very suspect of corporate motives. And Enron is the example, right? If a company has to shift some manufacturing to China to stay in business, what does the public think? They think greed to make the issues better understood by the members of Congress, better understood by your employees, better understood by the local media. It's very important to meet with editorial page editors and explain to them the ramifications of a particular bill, either on a state level or federal level, and what that impact is on your employees in that congressional district. 